So I had a patient come in to see me and she had been on birth control pills for the past 10 plus years. And she was really happy on the pill, but she stopped it when she wanted to get pregnant. And she noticed that her periods were initially okay after stopping the pill, but the longer the time went on, her period started spacing out, getting longer and longer, and then she started to also gain weight and have acne. And she researched online and she came in to see me because she said she had post-birth control pill syndrome. And we talked at length about this, and I don't judge her for trying to research her symptoms or get to the bottom of what was going on. But in her case, the birth control pill was not the problem. She actually had undiagnosed PCOS. And yes, the pill was a Band-Aid for this, so she didn't get to her true diagnosis soon enough. And as more time went on after she stopped the pill, her body started to revert back to what was happening. So one thing about the birth control pill as a side note is that one thing that it does is it lowers some of the testosterone levels in your body by increasing something called sex hormone binding globulin. So you'll have a lowering of those androgen symptoms in addition to it is an artificial estrogen and progesterone. So it prevents the brain from sending out FSH and LH. The pill is actually very short acting. So when you stop it, you can miss just one pill and ovulate and get pregnant, but it's going to wear out of your body. Depending on what is happening underneath, these symptoms might start to show if you have undiagnosed PCOS. And this patient had bought a lot of expensive cleanses to rid her body of the birth control. She had tried all these juice cleanses and these pills, but the reality was nothing she was experiencing right now was the birth control pills fault. Do I wish she'd stopped the pill earlier so we could attract her cycle, understood this was a problem sooner and started to work this up? Absolutely, of course. I wish she'd had an answer honestly, before she started birth control. But in her case, she spent money and time doing things that weren't really helping her and not understanding her PCMS or how she should manage it. So that was really something that she found on the internet that was false and misinformation that was putting her a little further behind. That's why I think it's so important for you to take charge of your own journey and know what's happening in your body. So when it comes to different types of medication for ovulation induction, depending on what is going on, we need to utilize different options. Let's use PCOS like this patient had. In PCOS, as we talked about, you are going to have this miscommunication between the brain and the ovary. There's many different body types for PCOS. There's this adage that, oh, all PCOS is associated with being overweight, and that's not the case, even though it does put you at risk for abdominal weight gain. But what happens is you have a resting estrogen level that is elevated. And why is this? Well, I told you that one mature egg is going to make about 200 picograms of estrogen, but a single egg that's immature, let's say it makes one picogram. So if you are an average patient and you have 20 eggs, your baseline estrogen level when no egg is growing might be around 20. Well, if you're a PCOS patient and you might have 40 eggs, your baseline estrogen is gonna be 40. When that 40 is seen by the brain, it thinks an egg is already starting to grow. So it is not gonna send out a stronger signal of FSH, it doesn't need to. It's actually gonna start decreasing FSH because your body only wants to have one egg ovulate at a time. There are checks and balances to prevent something worse from happening. So what is happening in your body is the brain is interpreting what it sees, but it's seeing this higher estrogen level that's not reflective of what it thinks. If you happen to be overweight, this is magnified because the fat cells make estrogen as well, and then the brain is seeing even a higher level of estrogen. So we really have to make the brain more sensitive to what's going on. And this is why the two most common medications for PCOS are going to be letrozole and Clomid for ovulation induction. Letrozole is the drug of choice. It's also known as Famara. It is what's called an aromatase inhibitor, fancy name, but essentially it is metabolizing estrogen in your bloodstream. So estrogen is still being made, still being made by the ovary, by the fat cells, but letrozole is coming in and gobbling it up, and so your levels are lowering. What happens is that the brain senses this decrease in estrogen and says, oh, hey, we don't have an egg growing. I should send out a stronger signal of FSH. Remember that the hormones are dynamic and they're supposed to respond. So in order to use letrozole for PCOS, you have to have a brain that is interpreting signals and can respond appropriately. But with letrozole, the brain will say, hey, this is lower, I'm gonna send out a stronger signal of FSH, and hopefully that signal now is stronger and can get to one of the eggs and get you to ovulate. Now, Clomid is an older medication that can be used, and it is what's called a CIRM, a Selective Estrogen Receptor Modulator. 
fancy name again. But what it does is it goes and it binds to estrogen receptors throughout your entire body. And when it binds to them, actual estrogen can't come in. And so your brain thinks you have no estrogen present. Similar net result is that, oh my gosh, if there's no estrogen, I'm gonna send out more FSH because I would like an egg to grow. Because it binds to all estrogen receptors, there's a few more negative side effects, notably feeling hypoestrogenic or headaches, hot flashes, mood swings. You also sometimes can have um, effect at the uterine lining. So occasionally on Clomid, we see a thinning of the uterine lining because there are estrogen receptors there. That is not the most common outcome, but it can happen. A study looked at Clomid and Letrozole head-to-head -head for PCOS patients, and even though they are both appropriate, Letrozole had higher live birth rates. So it is the preferred starting line medication for PCOS. When we use Letrozole for patients with PCOS, what we want to do is come in and get that FSH to increase earlier when you're early and before the brain has sent out too much FSH. So we typically wanna start it somewhere between day three to five of your menstrual cycle. You're gonna take Letrozole for five days. They're just pills. So you'll take pills for five days and then hopefully this will cause a surge in FSH and get an egg to grow. There's different ways that you're gonna find out if it worked or not. And depending on your age, your goals, your circumstance, your clinic, your doctor, you might do something different on the back end. Meaning you might be told to take ovulation predictor kits and look for that LH surge. You might go in for ultrasound monitoring. You might be told to check a progesterone level a week after suspected ovulation. And there's no one right or wrong way, and I've worked at practices that did all of the above, but of course, my preference is always gonna be the gold standard of watching with ultrasound. The reason why I like watching with ultrasound is we really know what's happening. This is called monitoring. I can measure the follicles, see when they're mature, and I can know if I'm gonna have an over response or an under response. So if nothing is happening, and I know this on ultrasound, I have the opportunity to increase the dose immediately. Essentially say, hey, that letrozole didn't get anything done. I'm gonna increase the dose, and now I'm gonna try to see if I can get a stronger signal with a higher dose. Really importantly for PCOS, we tend to think these medications have a threshold dose, meaning it's not that we're gonna get a bigger response with a bigger dose, it's just what dose is going to work for you. So I can do an ultrasound if you're not responding, increase the dose, bring you back next week. It's really just a faster way to get there. And one thing that you might find only in fertility clinics that your regular OBGYN may not be able to do. So in an OBGYN's office, you might be told to just check a progesterone level, which is okay, but only if you know when you ovulate. So you've gotta be tracking ovulation with other signs and symptoms. One way to do that was with ovulation predictor kits or OPKs, which are an LH surge detection. Although, asterisk, asterisk, if you're taking these medications and you're increasing FSH, you're increasing LH release also, and you can get false positives. So you have to wait long enough since you stopped using the medication before we see what's happening. And that's actually most specific for Clomid itself, more so than Letrozole. So if you're using Clomid, we don't wanna be taking OPKs right away or you might get false positives. So really talk with your doctor to try to get a plan. I usually recommend not even starting them for until you have finished the Clomid. And usually I wanna see at least four days pass from the last time you took it before we start OPKs. But again, every scenario is gonna be a little bit different. So if you are tough PCOS, it's not uncommon that we might try with Letrozole as the first line. We might stair step it up if things are not working. It's not wrong to try Clomid, have a handful of patients who I will get to max dose of Letrozole and not see a response. And so I might try Clomid just to see if a more profound drop in their estrogen gets the job done. So we'll try that sometimes. There's occasionally circumstances where I try them both together. It's not my favorite, but I've tried it. But another thing that we can use is metformin. Now you might be asking, why metformin? Does that really make me ovulate? Well, it can, especially in PCOS, because as we said, insulin resistance can be a part of the problem, causing that chronic inflammation and interfering with hormone signaling. Metformin works to help the cells intake insulin better, therefore it can use that and lower your sugar. So metformin alone, actually, in patients who have insulin resistance, can improve ovulation. It's been proven to do so in studies. So it's a great first line mechanism, especially if you're not necessarily trying to conceive or you don't want to be paying for ovulation induction or treatment. It can be an important lifestyle mechanism. It can help improve your lifelong risk. And if it can improve your ovulation pattern for your overall health, that's fantastic. I recommend if we're going to be on metformin, stair-stepping up the dose of it because it can cause some GI distress, which often leads to people stopping it a little bit too early. 
But anybody with PCOS who's got insulin resistance, this is something that I want to bring to the table. I also find that inositols can increase insulin sensitivity, and this is something over the counter you can do that really has very few side effects that I recommend for everybody with PCOS to give it a try and see how you feel. Because anything that can make your cells more responsive to insulin, insulin is the hormone that controls sugar being utilized from your cells, so decreasing it from your bloodstream and into your cells. And sugar is the fuel that you need for your muscles to work, for hormones to be produced, and really to try to lower your chronic inflammation, that can be key. And I find with metformin, we know the studies show you might have an improved response to ovulation induction medication or to IVF as well. So if you do have insulin resistance, it can be an important option for an add-on, but sometimes we try it as its own first to see what happens. <music> 